We want to look this evening at the words that we find in the book of Job that we read in chapter 42 and at verse 10, where we read, The Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Some more modern versions have a slight variation on that wording, which perhaps we'll refer to later, but that's the statement of the verse. The Lord turned the captivity, took away the captivity of Job, when he prayed for his friends. Now my subject this evening has to do with a discouragement and a disappointment which is peculiar to Christians. That is to say, until we become Christians, this would never give us any concern at all. But here's a real discouragement that comes to those that are real Christians. And that is, sometimes, thankfully not everywhere, and not always, but sometimes there is a falling out between fellow Christians. Some argument, some disagreement, some breakup of relationships. It happens. If the devil was given his way, it would happen far, far more often. But he is restrained. But it is a fact that it does happen. So I'm sure some of us here have experienced it. We may have to experience it in the future. And the question then arises, how do you explain this? You know, it's very unnatural for sheep to attack other sheep. They don't do that. And it's very unnatural for Christians to fall out with fellow Christians. And yet, it happens. And what are we to make of it? And how are we to address it? What guidance does the scripture give us on this subject? Well, that's the theme that's related to our text. Scripture says, New Testament says that the word of God is given to us that the man of God might be perfect, truly furnished, completely furnished unto every good work. So if we have a problem about anything of a spiritual nature, we can be sure we can turn to Scripture for light on it. And on the problem that I'm just mentioning, this breakdown of closeness between brethren. Here's scripture which throws light on it for us. Now briefly to remind you of the, what happens in this book of Job. Job was a man who lived very in early times, so early that we have no specific dates, but he was a man who lived in the Middle East. And uh, in the first three chapters of this book, we are given an account of his life, chapters one to three. And then from chapter 4 toward, till towards the end of the book, we're given an account of his meeting with his three friends. And then another one joins the discussion, Elihu. And then God comes and clears the whole thing and puts it in its proper light. So the first thing is Job himself. And here he is in uh, comfort and prosperity when he begins And God permits real affliction to come on him. Bereaved of family, loses his livelihood, his health is broken down, he is brought into a very low condition. And then we read in chapter 2 how these friends come uh, to help him. Uh, Eliphaz and Zophar and Bildad, and they they come from uh, different areas. We're told the locations that they come from. And uh, they come, certainly, to be a comfort to him. But instead of that happening, they fall into an argument. And the argument gets heated. And uh, these friends say things to Job that they ought not to have said. And Job, in reply, says that they are miserable physicians, forgers, he says, of lies. So here is something that completely breaks down. And there are two things that we have to notice at first. First of all, it's underlined in the scripture that these men are friends. Our text says that. When Job prayed for his friends, they weren't critics. They came intending to comfort Job. And we're told that when they came, Job here was surrounded with bereavement and loss and grief. And uh, they understood his pain. They, they sat down and it says that for seven days they didn't really speak to him. They were there 
to consult him and they knew one of the first lessons when you're seeking to consult someone who's in heavy grief is that you say very little just being there and that's what they did in their sympathy with Job they stayed with him in this manner so they were friends they were not only friends but the scripture makes clear that they were also the children of God they have long speeches because when they do begin to speak to Job they direct him to scripture and they talk about the holiness and the justice and the power of God and they bring various scriptures to Job's mind and yet uh, we find that they were wrong in what they said to Job not that they spoke falsehoods to Job no they didn't do that but they misapplied truths to Job which is a different matter they had got high views of God's attributes. Their, their words wouldn't have been recorded at this length in Scripture had they been falsehood. No, they weren't falsehoods. But as I say, they were misapplications of truth. So now we have three main points to try to consider. And the first was, what was wrong with the advice that these three friends gave to Job? There was something wrong with it. Chapter 42 at the end tells us that. God was displeased with them. What was wrong with what they said? And then the second truth is, what had to be done to end this breakdown between them? What had to be done? And thirdly, we are told what they themselves had to do. Because the second thing, what had to be done, was something that God had to do. But thirdly, there's something that they had to do. So let's try to follow those three points. The first being, what was wrong in the advice and counsel that they intended to be helpful to Job. And here we can say they had an explanation of why Job was in this problem and difficulty. And they believed they knew the answer. And their answer was, because God is holy, God judges people for their sins. And for Job to have had this degree of trouble and affliction put on him was surely evidence that he wasn't really a child of God at all. There was some hidden sin. There was something in Job that had warranted God acting in this way that these things had all happened to Job. Now Job replying agrees with them that the things that have happened to him, God's hand has been in it. Job knows that God reigns over all. Things don't happen by accident. But, this is the difference. But Job said, these things weren't happening to him because he was an unbeliever. He wasn't a hypocrite. He wasn't hiding sins. There wasn't something grievous that he had done in the past that God was now reckoning on. No, Job says, that's not true. I, I'm not a hypocrite. They were saying to Job, you now need to repent and make your peace with God. You need to be reconciled to God. But Job said, no, that's not true. I know, he said, I know that my Redeemer liveth. Though he slay me, Job says, I will trust in him. So here, here's the argument. These counselors say, Job cannot be a real Christian, a real believer. And Job says, I am. And that became their argument. Now, what shall we say was the cause of the explanation of the argument? It was really this, that these counsellors had a, a weak, defective understanding of the ways of God. They were thinking, if such circumstances happen to anybody, that's proof that they can't be the children of God. That was their assumption. But it wasn't true. It is true that God judges human life. It's true also that sometimes lives are cut off because of sin. But it's not true that afflictions and trials of a very grievous nature, it's not true that they only happen to unbelievers. Job was a believer. And so the first fault of these friends was their imperfect view of God. And then it was a second fault in their thinking. They were not told what we were told when we read part of chapter 1. 
that's a very mysterious chapter, but it speaks to us of a great reality. There are in this world unseen powers of darkness. They are headed up by Satan, prince of darkness. If people only believed that in Britain today, we'd have a far better understanding of what's going on. But that's true. And our Lord says, speaking of Satan, that he is a murderer and a liar from the beginning. And in saying that, our Lord is referring right back to Genesis chapter 3, where our first parents are tempted by the evil one, drawn into sin, and they fall. And on through the Old Testament, there is this evidence that people don't simply sin and act wrongly entirely independently. Oh no, the Bible says when people live an ungodly life, they are living under the influence and control of another power. And we see that through history. And that's true today. So many people today think, well, we wouldn't be Christians because God, if there is a God, God is against us. God won't make us happy. Religion won't make us happy. Where does that idea come from? It comes from the devil. The devil teaches men and women, the further we are from God, the more happy we're likely to be. Well, the truth of that runs through Scripture. Now, these friends of Job should have suspected that the hand of the devil was in this, but they didn't. There's not a reference to it. They've quite forgotten it. They shouldn't have forgotten it. Different parts of the Old Testament teach very clearly. The book of Zechariah tells us in chapter 3 of that book, it speaks of the high priest and servant of God in Jerusalem. And then it says, Satan at his right hand to resist him. This high priest was seeking to honor God and worship God, and he had got a mighty hindrance right next to him. My friends, that's true of us. If we're Christians, we're seeking to honor God. We have an adversary. Even as we're sitting in a service like this, we shoot into our heads, a weird, terrible thought it may be. We, we are not uh, intact in this world. We are subject to principalities and powers of darkness. And our Lord warns us of that. And the scriptures warn us of that. And yet, here in the book of Job, th this has been forgotten. There's a parable that our Lord teaches. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a good man who goes into his field and he sows the wheat in the ground carefully, does his work, and, and then he sleeps. But, says our Lord, while he slept, an enemy came and sowed tears, weeds through the crop. And then when the wheat begins to come up, Lo, there are weeds and tears coming up too. And the question is, how do you explain this? And the Lord's answer is, an enemy has done this. That's right, an enemy has done it. And sadly, sometimes when there are troubles amongst Christians and arguments and fallings out, people don't remember that. An enemy has done this. This isn't natural. This shouldn't be happening. And these friends of Job should have recognized that themselves, but they didn't. Many, many people today have no concern about satanic activity. They don't believe in it. And if we're Christians, we are not conditioned by the media or the radio or newspapers ever to believe that there is such a power of darkness at work. Jesus says the God of this world works in the children of disobedience. Now then, the second point. How was this situation addressed? How was the breach in their friendship healed? And here I've got a quotation from an old Puritan that I'll give you. He says, When even good men are yoked in debate, ordinarily they are thereby the more confirmed in their own opinion till God interposes. In other words, if we were left to ourselves, our disputes might go on forever. God in his mercy interposes. God is a great peacemaker and he makes peace and he makes his children to be peacemakers. So that is really the argument of what follows later in this book. Something has to be done to Job by God 
And that is, he needs to be humbled. Because the truth is that his failure was very closely similar to the failure of these false counselors. Job had come to the conclusion that God was dealing unjustly with him and severely with him. He was acting as though he was an enemy. That's what he said. He complains to God. And he complains to God because he thinks he understands God's ways. And he didn't. And to show him that he didn't, God, in those chapters 38, 40, 41, there is a beautiful description drawn from nature. Job is kind of summoned to answer some questions. And the questions begin like this. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you then? Can you measure the breadth of the earth? Where were you when the morning stars sang together at the creation? What do you know about the behemoth, these old animals that we hear of and have long passed out of history but see replicas of in museums, the behemoth and the leviathan? And God speaks of the behemoth as an animal that has a tail like a cedar tree. And he puts Job down in this great creation where God's power and wisdom and might is exemplified and he says to Job, who are you to think you can understand my ways? How fragmentary your knowledge is. How little you know. That's right. So what we have find Job saying in chapter 42, verse 3, I have uttered, he says, this is his confession, I have uttered that I, things that I understood not, things too wonderful for me that I knew not. And then he goes on to say, verse 5, I have heard of thee, of God. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. I understand more. Wherefore, what happens? Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Who was I ever to think that I could direct God's ways and understand all God's ways? What am I but a poor, needy sinner that needs God's grace and help? In other words, what stops argument and contention and fallouts? Humility. Humility. John Bunyan says, He that is down, he that is down, need fear no fall. He that is low, no pride. Job is humbled. And when we are humbled, contention and bitterness don't live with humility. If I'm truly humbled, I can't be filled with enmity or argument, contention, humility. God humbled Job. And my friends, it isn't a comfortable thing often for us to be humbled. But if God loves us, you can be sure part of his dealing with us will be to humble us. The scripture says, he fills the hungry with good things, but the rich he sends empty away. He's not talking about money. He's talking about people who are self-satisfied, people who can say that they understand this and understand that and know God's ways. God sends them away. But the hungry, the empty, the needy, the, those that confess their, their need, God helps them. Now, that, that's the point then we come to in chapter 42. God has interposed in this argument. He is a great peacemaker. Now, when that has happened, we are next confronted with what comes as a surprise. Job says, I abhor myself. Verse 7, And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, My wrath, my anger is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for you have not spoken of me the thing that is right as my servant Job. Now here's something. Both parties had said things that were wrong. No doubt about that. But God takes a more serious view of what these counselors had said. In his tenderness and compassion, he, as it were, overlooks Job's wrong words. Job has been humbled. But these counselors of Job, they have something more to do. And what they have to do is this, we read, Take now seven bullocks and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. Now what is all that about? Well, something tremendously important. 
We as sinners cannot appear before God because of our sins. And right from the beginning, book of Genesis, we are taught there's only one way into God's presence. And that's as sin is dealt with and forgiven. And how could that be? Well, in the Old Testament, it was revealed. God can save us through a substitute. And the people were taught to worship God by bringing the live animal, ox, ram. And that animal, that innocent animal, was put to death. The worshipper was to put his hands on the animal, and the animal was slain. For without the shedding of blood, says Scripture, there's no remission of sins. And what is that doing? That's pointing forward to the great day when there would be a real atonement, when God's own Son would come. It's a wonderful thing in the Old Testament, long before Calvary, thousands of years before. This was pointed out to men and women. Remember the day when Abraham was going to, he was being tried. There was, he was on Mount Moriah and there was the altar for a burnt sacrifice. And Isaac says to Abraham, my father, here's the fire and the provision, but where is the lamb? And Abraham says, my son, God will provide the lamb. That's prophetic. Jesus says, Abraham saw my day. He saw it and was glad. What we have here is that these friends of Job had to confess that their sin was of such a nature that it it warranted death. They therefore had to bring sacrifice and the sacrifice was accepted in their place. That's the way of salvation. The only way of salvation is that someone else stands in my place and receives what I deserve. They had to do that. We have to do that, although we do it now in a different way through faith in Christ. There are some things that are very hard to understand about this point, but one thing comes out, and that is, it's what our Lord says in Matthew chapter 12, by your words you will be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. In other words, what we say counts in the sight of God. Jesus says it shows what's in our heart. Words that we may say carelessly, offhand, God may take a very different view of them. Now here were these counsellors, and as I reminded you, they were speaking truth, but they were misapplying it. And in doing so, they were misrepresenting God. And God was angry with them. That's what it says. God was angry with Eliphaz and so far and so on. You know, we're so accustomed to sin in speech and words that we hardly understand it. But yet, it's possible to be speaking orthodox truth and yet to be sinning in doing so, misapplying it, injuring people who shouldn't be injured, treating people as not as Christians who actually are Christians. There, that's a reason why the New Testament says, my brethren, be not many teachers, because if teachers are wrong, then all kinds of wrongs follow. That's what's happening in Britain today. People stand up, profess the name of Christ, and they appear to speak words which are utterly misrepresenting God. We sing that every day. A lot of millions of people saw it happen yesterday. They had to bring this sacrifice to God. You have not, God says, you have not spoken of me the thing that is right. And so what we have here, as I was trying to say to you, is a foreshadowing of Calvary. And what Calvary teaches us is, in the presence of God delivering his son for us, There is no room for contention and pride and breakdowns of friendship. If God so loved us, we ought to love one another. At Calvary, we read that these Roman soldiers were arguing amongst themselves uh, who would have this garment, who would have that. They were utterly blind to what was happening. But you know, sometimes we can act a little bit like that, get into arguments with fellow Christians and forget that we owe everything to Christ and to his shed blood. And so do these, our friends with whom we are disputing. Apostle Paul says, be ye kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. What a great verse that is. Be tender-hearted, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. 
A new commandment I give unto you, Jesus said, that ye love one another as I have loved you. The commandment to love wasn't new, but the example of how to love was new, as Christ has loved us. So that's what's happening here. These believers of Old Testament times are brought to understand mercy coming to them through sacrifice. And that brings us to the last point. There was something that these disputing Christians had to do. And in the case of these uh, three counsellors, uh, they had to go, as we've just been hearing, and they had to go uh, with sacrifice. And then we read, God says that Job would pray for them. Now, that's a great statement, because while this argument had been going on, Job, I'm afraid you can be sure, had not been praying for them. When we fall out with people, we don't really pray for them. We might sometimes say we do, but we don't. We lose heart affection. And you know, love is the soil out of which prayer comes, and if love dries up, prayer will dry up. Job hadn't been praying. They, they were his friends, but he had forgotten that for the time being. But now, God says he will pray for his friends. They were his friends. And Job now had the understanding they were his friends. Of course they were his friends. And he would pray for them. And the Lord would turn the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. That's what the verse says. Now coming to that translation point briefly. The King James Version I've been quoting by the word captivity means this, that these fellow believers were in a sort of constraint and con they'd lost their liberty as believers. They were in a sort of captivity of mind. Job was in that, and so were these others. And, you know, you can be in a sort of bondage and uh, captivity when your th thoughts aren't free and you're occupied with, with uh, one thing only and this, this dispute with so-and-so that you can't get out of your mind and it, it, put, it makes you like a prisoner. And th it's a kind of captivity. It's an inward thing. Now, other people say that the Hebrew word should rather be translated like fortune. His outward circumstances changed. The Lord turned, took away the captivity, the, the circumstances of Job when he prayed for his friends. Was it some outward thing and well, it doesn't really matter. The vital thing is this. When Job prayed, something happened. And that's what the Bible teaches us everywhere. God is a prayer-hearing God. Let the needy go to God and pray. God will do something for them or for those for whom they pray. Not necessarily what we pray for, but what is best. And that's why the New Testament, indeed the whole Bible, puts such emphasis on intercessory prayer. Praying always, Paul says, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and for all saints. For all saints. Paul says to the Philippians, this, that is his deliverance, he was in prison, this shall come to my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Intercessory prayer prayer. The great hindrance to prayer is pride and sin. And sin is our narrow views of God and our high views of ourselves. And where there is sin, there's not going to be prayer. But when Job is restored, he's praying. And he's praying for his friends. You see, that parable that our Lord told is so much to the point. In Matthew chapter 18, Here's a wealthy owner of land and possessions, and he's got a steward who undertakes things for him, and this steward gradually got careless with money until he owed 10,000 talents in money. It's a huge quantity. I don't know how you translate it into modern terms, but he owed this huge amount of money. And when the owner heard about it, he said, this is it. You're gone and everything is gone and you'll pay every farthing and you'll, you'll go to prison till you do. And the man fell down at his feet, pleaded with him, have mercy on me, have pity on me. And his Lord did and forgave him that debt. And what did the man do? He went out and he looked around and he saw so-and-so who owed him a hundred pence, the scripture says, pitiful little amount, but he owed it. 
He said, pay me now what you're owing me. I can't, the man said, and fell down at his feet and said, and pleaded with him, have pity on me and, and I will pay you all. No, he said, you'll go straight to prison. That's what he did. It's our Lord's parable. Our Lord's parables were full of powerful truth, weren't they? And so then Jesus ended the parable by saying, that's how God will deal with us. If we don't have pity and compassion on fellow sinners, don't think that God will have compassion on us. If we pray, Jesus said, we have to pray to our Father and we have to say to him, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. What's that mean? We don't hold in our heart any animosity, hostility to other brethren as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now, you may think, maybe someone here who thinks, this isn't relevant to me tonight. And I wouldn't blame you for thinking that. I'm sure once upon a time I didn't think it was very relevant even when I was a Christian. But as you get older, this is a world in which, sadly, the devil is busy. And we need to beware, as Paul says, of his devices. One of his devices, primary one, is to try and weaken love between saints and then introduce some point of difference and then perhaps a fallout. And the converse of that is true. It's where there's real prayer and love in a church. The work of God goes forward. Somebody once asked Charles Haddon Spurgeon, how do you account for the success of your church? And you know what he said? My people pray for me. Pray for me. And that's true. That is true. God hears intercessory prayer. Don't stop praying for your pastor. He's out of sight for a little bit. Look forward to him coming home. Surround him with prayer. You know, it's a great encouragement uh, for men to come and preach here. And I don't mean to flatter you. That wouldn't, that's not good to do for anyone. But there's prayer for the preaching. You, you understand that Whoever stands here is not going to, of himself, bring you any blessing. He needs God's help, and you pray for him. My friends, God has taught you that. And that lesson has to be deepened more and more. When churches begin to go downhill, and no blessing, and nothing happening, what's wrong? Something has gone. My people pray for me, Spurgeon said. And it, when God's people pray for their pastors, wonderful things do happen. With this text, has been speaking about brotherly love. The Holy Spirit gives love between saints. But there's a broader love, isn't there? You know, it used to be said of George Whitfield that he loved even the devil's castaways, by which he was meant that his compassion and concern for people ran over all boundaries, not just brethren, but the love of God and compassion was in him. That's what we need today. We need a new endowment of the Holy Spirit, and he, Holy Spirit, gives love, peace, joy. So thank you, my friends, and it reminded me that a few notes I mentioned, if you'd like to take that, I know one or two of you tried to pray for us, we value that. We can never tell, never tell in this world what we owe to the intercession of friends, and we pray that God will help you all and bless you, and his name will be magnified in this church more and more. Shall we pray? O oh Lord, help us to look to thee. Deliver us from all thoughts of self and man. Lord, what can we do apart from thee? We thank thee that it is by thy work, and by thy work alone, that the kingdom of God is built. Oh, we pray that thou wouldst help us to pray, teach us to pray, grant us more of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the compassion one for another, and for a needy world around us day by day. Lord, thou art able to do this. Help thy people here. Bless them week by week, and all who come to speak in every prayer meeting and gathering, Lord, help them all to pray. Receive our thanks and pardon our sins. For Jesus' sake, amen. amen.